Hello, friends. Let me open my Bible and get out my script, take a look at it, and then we'll be on our way today. This is Praying Exodus video number five, and we're talking about Exodus 12 and verse 37 through chapter 16 and verse one. But before we get to that particular text, I want to say just a few words about the Passover, even though the Passover precedes this text. The Passover, uh, this event is not in the text, but there's so much here that we could talk about that I'd like to talk about. Uh, first of all, you know that God instructed the Israelites to paint the blood of the sacrificial lamb on the tops and sides of the door frames. Now, what is this? Well, for the Israelites, it was a sign that the occupants of that house are placing themselves under God's protection and so will be spared. And of course, I apply that so easily. And I know that you do too when I think about the blood of Christ. And I'm always asking God to look at the blood of Christ, see the blood of Christ. He is, that blood is covering my sins. And that blood over my soul is a sign to me and to God that I will be protected by him that I will, not be, uh, I will not suffer punishment because of my sins. And then the unleavened bread, that was part of the Passover feast, wasn't it? Well, it too was a symbol. The symbolic significance of the bread made without yeast must be this. The journey is to be made in haste, the journey away from Egypt. So there is no time to let the dough rise. And of course, the most obvious application of the Passover is instituted by Christ himself and by the church's regular celebration of the Lord's Supper. We Christians remember the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is our Passover lamb, according to the New Testament. We remember that every Sunday when we eat the Lord's Supper. And of course, we eat it every Sunday because the early Christians ate it every Sunday on the first day of the week. Now, what are we celebrating when we eat that supper? We are celebrating our redemption through Christ and the glory that awaits us, right? The Lord's Supper then is a serious thing. It's serious business. This is why it's good for us to remind ourselves of what we are doing and for whom the meal is intended. It is not something to be taken lightly by those who are in Christ. This is an important ritual in the church today. Now, let's talk about God's right to the firstborn. God does not want Israel to forget the terrible means by which their redemption was enacted. What did their redemption require? It required that someone or something die. So, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb is a constant reminder to Israel that their life came from death. They must remember as a consequence that the firstborn of the womb belongs to God. It is his by right. The destroyer of the tenth plague was not a random type of punishment. It was directed against the Egyptian firstborn, and this is significant. Not only was the tenth plague a payback for Pharaoh's decree to kill the Israelite children in chapter 1, but it was also God's exercising his divine right over the firstborn. The Passover, then, is not simply a matter of a lamb replacing the Israelites' firstborn. It is also God purchasing, so to speak, the redemption of his firstborn son Israel through the death of the Egyptian firstborn since it was precisely this catastrophe that led Pharaoh to call for Israel's release. Of course, I'm thinking of what our redemption required, aren't you? The death of God's own firstborn son. And as a result of that death, all of us who have been redeemed by that death of God's firstborn belong to God. We are his. We were purchased by him because of the death of his firstborn. The right of God to select the firstborn for his own. We belong to God, we don't belong to ourselves. That'll preach, won't it? Okay, so we're going to leave the Passover now. Israel leaves Egypt, and what goes with them? According to our text, a pillar of cloud by fire, 
a, a pillar of cloud by day, I mean, to lead them, and a pillar of fire by night. And, of course, these manifestations were symbols of the Lord's presence in their midst. So in the daytime, the pillar of cloud would lead them, God would be leading them, and at night, the pillar of fire would protect them and direct them. It was it was the presence of God in their midst. And what does God do in our text? He marches his people toward the sea, leaving them no escape route from Pharaoh's armies who are giving chase. And I think it's interesting in this case that God does not so much predict Pharaoh's move as force the move himself. Like a master chess player, God induces Pharaoh to move his king into checkmate and Pharaoh doesn't even realize it. Again, we stand in awe at the plan of God. You know, God's plan is real and true, and it will not be thwarted. Whatever God has planned to do, he will do. Okay. As the people of Israel look back and see Pharaoh and his armies approaching, what do they do? Well, once again, they complain to Moses and against God. You brought us out here to die, didn't you? It would have been better had we stayed in Egypt. Their grumbling is such a common theme in these Old Testament books, isn't it? And here they are, throwing one of their frequent temper tantrums. Unbelievably, their faith is paper thin. After seeing all the plagues God brought on Egypt, after experiencing their own deliverance from Egypt, they still lack the trust in God that he can and will see them through whatever hardship comes. Of course, uh, there's a lesson here for us too, isn't there? Look back over your life. See the hand of the Lord. Know that there is no problem or difficulty that he cannot handle for your good. Then we have the Song of Victory in chapter 15, a chapter, by the way, that does not close until we learn that Israel yet again complains because of a lack of water. But God is so patient with his people and he provides water for them when Moses throws a piece of wood into the water and the water becomes sweet. So, in this section, there is so much to talk about and so much to apply to our own lives. But we have talked about the importance of of the Lord's Supper, and as it is a continuation, so to speak, of the Passover. You see, we, are, we find ourselves in a long line of redemptive acts, and those acts are ritualized for us. We've talked about the importance of the ritual of the Lord's Supper. We've talked about the importance of, of, of trusting in God to, to see us through any and every difficulty. We've talked about the danger of grumbling and complaining against God and not trusting in him. And we've talked about the power and the plan of God. There's a lot here, isn't there? Well, that's certainly enough for today. In our next video, we'll talk about God's provision of manna and quail. We'll talk about the good advice that Moses receives from his father-in-law. And we'll talk about Israel's journey to the mountain of God where the people will get yet another demonstration of the power and fearfulness of their God. So, I'll see you next week, and may God continue to bless your study through the book of Exodus.